This presentation is a recording of an introduction to the Family Child Care Home regulations that are effective September 1, 2016. This is presented by Crystal Michaud, Licensing Supervisor, and Heather Madison, Operations Administrator at the Vermont Department for Children and Families, Child Development Division. This webinar was presented for training hours, however, training hours are not available for viewing this version of the presentation. The focus of this presentation is to introduce the process of regulation training and to provide basic information on how to read the regulations. For answers to specific questions about your program, please call the licensor on duty at 1-800-649-2642. We just wanted to get started with reviewing the learning objectives for this webinar tonight. There's three basic objectives. The first one is to spend some time talking about the implementation plan or, or rollout of the new regulations and give you guys an understanding of what's happened up until now and what to continue to expect. The second objective for tonight is to review basic tips with how to read licensing rules. Um, and then following that, we'll be sharing different resources that are available to support um, the process of coming into compliance with the new rules. So let's jump right in to talking about the implementation plan. We'll talk about the timeline of what to expect and when to expect it. And if you look at the beginning, and we see here that it talks about frequently asked questions survey. So this timeline really begins around June when the rules were adopted. And um, between June and July, we posted the frequently asked questions survey to our website. People have been busy writing and sending in questions. And we have started generating responses to those questions. And we'll continue to do that weekly moving forward. And if you have a question, send it in. If, you, if it's a general, general question or you're not sure really what rule to connect it to directly, it's OK. You can just write general question under the number line on the survey. When you go on our website and you pull up the frequently asked questions, there will be an indicator to let you know what's newer for responses so that you can kind of find things on that website, so that'll help you. The other thing we did in June to kind of kick things off was have a community partner meeting with resource development specialists, Vermont Birth to Five mentors and Basie mentors, to share with them this timeline and tips on how to read the licensing rules and kind of help them come up to speed with what was happening so they can best be supporting you in the communities. and. We also had our mailing that went out. So everybody received a copy of the licensing rules. We also sent um, multiple copies to the local resource agencies. So if you know of anybody that needs a copy or wants a copy or you yourself need an additional copy, you can feel free to um, send people there or go there and pick up extra copies. Um, and as those supplies are depleted, we will be sending them new, new copies, additional copies. So that's a resource. So as August started, we started the month off with a meeting with our starting points leaders in the various communities throughout Vermont where we shared with them the implementation rollout plan and tips on how to read rules and, and supporting them with how best to support their fellow providers. And today we've offered this webinar um, both during the nap time time period as well as this evening for the family home rules. And we'll be doing the same version tomorrow specific to the center-based rules, both during um, the mid-afternoon as well as the evening. And this webinar is really designed to help people know what to expect and kind of kick things off. The other big thing that we're doing this month is training our licensing staff so that they um, get some familiarness with the new rules, the intent behind the rules, and can best support people coming into compliance and, and applying the rules themselves and the work that they do. As fall happens, we all know September 1st, and that is the big date. Um, but this process really began many, many months ago. It actually began several years ago when we started drafting the revised regulations. And over the last several months, there's all sorts of 
activities, as you can see from the first two um, points on the timeline that's been happening. So September 1st is a point in time, but we're actually going to be working on implementation of these rules well beyond September 1st. Uh, the other thing that's happening, um, and let me back up and, and share that new rules being implemented September 1st are for family homes, center-based, and after-school programs. So all three arenas are having new rules be implemented. So another thing that is becoming available this fall is a mock compliance visit um, regarding the new rules. And there's going to be an application that's available, and we'll send out a notice when that's available and welcome people to fill out the application. Um, but what basically the mock compliance visit is an opportunity for licensing staff to go into homes, and um, the centers will also have the same opportunity and to practice building and establishing consistency with applying and interpreting the licensing rules. Anybody who participates in that will be it's voluntary, and it is a visit that would be scheduled and announced. Um, and it's an opportunity for any program or provider that participates in it to get a chance to see how where they're at with meeting the new licensing rules and compliance. The intent behind that visit is really educational. So we would not be citing non-compliance. Um, the only time we might have to cite non-compliance is if there was something that was egregious. And um, so that means it would be a serious violation. We might still have to cite that. And that would really be like, for example, um, someone spanked a child for discipline practices during our visit. Um, we can't not cite that. But for the most part, we wouldn't be citing anything as noncompliance. Everything would be an educational opportunity, and it's a practice opportunity for the staff, and the benefit to the program is to see where they're at. And what you should know is that there will definitely be two licensors, because they're teaming together to, for their learning process. And in some instances, a supervisor might also be with them. So if your home is a particularly small home, it may not work for you to volunteer for that. And you also may want to consider having uh, somebody else present so that you can really utilize that time to debrief and gain as much learning from the debriefing as you can and really benefit from the visit. So that will be coming available, and we'll be focusing on doing that in the beginning of the fall. And the other big thing is the BFIS changes. So there's some changes that will need to happen to BFIS as a result of new um, rules, and that will be implemented. We've done changes to BFIS before. There'll be some guidance and information sharing around that. Um, so those are some of the immediate things that will be next steps. Okay, so we have our first question, and that is during the compliance visit, will they be checking on things in the old regulations and visiting with on those, talking about those? They'll be, it'll be run as much like a standard compliance visit as we can, and it will be just really looking at the program as a whole. There may be some instances where we focus on specific things because it's an opportunity to really gain insight and understanding and build consistency, but generally speaking, it would be a standard kind of compliance format. Okay. And the other question related to that is, um, would there be violations if something should have been in compliance prior to the new regulation? So if it was an old, the current regulation? No. The goal really is a learning opportunity. So like I said, the only thing we would be required to cite for noncompliance is if something rose to the level of a serious violation, like using corporal punishment in our presence. Mm -hmm. Um, so would it, I have one more question, but I think it might be helpful for you, Crystal, if you could clarify the difference between the compliance visit that might happen later and the mock compliance visit. So a mock compliance visit is an opportunity for licenses to practice applying and really gain the hands-on experience after they've had the classroom training on the new rules. and. Um, and so it's really for our learning. It's really not to actually assess 
the program like we would be during a standard compliance visit. And that's why we would specifically not be citing violations unless they were serious in nature. Okay. And then um, one, two others. Um, can, can they set up the appointment for the mock compliance visit? So those mock compliance visits will be announced and scheduled. So anybody who's interested would apply when you get noticed that that is online on our website for you to apply. Because of the volume we anticipate receiving, you would only be notified if your program was selected. We, you would get a phone call. It would be a scheduled visit, a planned visit. And we are looking to do them all around the state because we have licensors all around the state and we want them all to be able to have the same practice opportunity. We did the same thing with after school um, in January when their rules were first implemented. We did it, I think it was around the spring when we got to doing those compliance, mock compliance visits and it was very well received. So. Okay. so I think most of the questions were related to that. So I want to move on. If I yep. need other questions, I'll mm -hmm. give them to you. So by late fall, we will be, late fall, beginning of winter, we will be offering online and community-based trainings that are specific to these licensing rules. So you have a rule 133 that says the family child care provider is required to attend the training on these new rules specifically. So that training we're in the process of developing now. It'll be coming available. It'll they'll the online option versus a community-based option, so it really meets different people's needs. And we'll clearly identify that it's the training that meets these new rules. And there will be another round of BFIS changes that um, will be implemented at that later in the fall as well. I do want to clarify that um, the fundamentals class has a fundamentals licensing regulation training that the first half of the class is really geared towards somebody who's new to the profession and talks about, you know, who is CDD, what to, you know, who is licensing, what to expect during a licensing visit. And the second half of that training is specific around scenarios and how to apply licensing rules. And those scenarios, licensing rules that go along with those scenarios will be from these new regulations. Now, if you're a family child care provider and you're completing fundamentals, you'll have a choice whether or not you want to attend the fundamentals licensing regulation training or 133. I would recommend that everyone plan on taking this, this training on, that meets the rule 133 because um, you're required to do that. If either one of those two trainings will meet the level one certificate you would gain. Um, if for some reason you want to complete your level one certificate sooner versus later and you want to take the fundamentals licensing regulation training, you're more than welcome to do it. Just be mindful that when the training specific to these rules that really delve deep into these rules becomes available, that meets 133, you will need to take that again. Um, if you complete everything else with fundamentals and you decide to wait and do the training um, that's relevant for Rule 133, you can do it at that time and finish your level certificate that way. Um, so anybody who has questions about that can feel free to call the licensor on duty line or talk with your local resource development specialist around what might fit your needs best. Then later in the winter, we will have our guidance manuals. Um, one manual is being um, developed for each set of regulations and it'll be a guide to how to um, understand the licensing rules. It's, it's not possible to create a guidance manual when your rules haven't been adopted, so we haven't been able to create it prior to now. And we're going to be using the training opportunities and the beginning stages of implementing new rules as also a tool to help us best know what to put in those guidance manuals. So those will be coming later in the winter. Okay, so we have a few questions. Uh, so I'm going to just run through some of them. Some we might have to um, wait until later as we're going to answer them in the presentation, but feel free to just let me know that, Crystal. Okay. So the first one was a question about um, why some providers that have been doing it a long time didn't have rules grandfathered 
who aren't grandfathered into some of the rules? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. Um, a lot of our rule changes that have happened have been based on new state laws or, or laws that have been updated in the state of Vermont or have been based on federal laws, which doesn't give us the opportunity to grandfather anybody. Everybody has to be in compliance. Any federal laws that our rules are based on is what supports our subsidy funding. If Vermont is not in compliance with those federal laws, we will not have our subsidy funds. So it's really important that um, everybody is in compliance. And that's the main reason why we didn't grandfather you know, people more often than not. The other thing is, is that we really want to support people all being on the same page. Okay. So we have received several questions about level certificates and fundamentals, um, and I'm going to try to combine them all into one question. So if I miss your question, feel free to just retype your question in. Um, basically, the questions were, do people need to take fundamentals if they already have level one or level two? Um, and if they haven't yet taken fundamentals, will they need to take fundamentals? If you already have your level one certificate, that is synonymous with the fundamentals. And if you have level two, you're at a higher level beyond fundamentals. Um, in terms of whether or not you need to take it, um, will depend upon how you meet the qualifications that are outlined. So that's a really detailed question and something that would be for uh, the tra you know, trainings that we'll be looking at specific rules, which goes beyond the focus of this particular training. Um, we do have some frequently asked questions around some of these, and so we will be putting some guidance there. And after September 1st, you can certainly call the licensor on duty line. So um, any kinds of specific questions about specific rules, be looking right now to either enter a question on the frequently asked questions survey and go to the website to see what responses are being posted. And so a uh, final question about fundamentals. Is fundamentals going to be offered as an online training for providers that have children until after about 630? There's different um, models of fundamentals around the state. Um, I think that would really be a question for your local resource agency who would be able to best tell you what kinds of options exist. And if someone took fundamentals already, does that cover Rule 133? The Fundamentals Licensing Regulation Training does not cover Rule 133. Because 133 is really going to delve into these specific rules in more depth than the general Fundamentals Licensing Regulation Training does. OK. So we've also received two very specific questions about regulations that I am going to hold till a little bit later so okay. we can get into the next part of the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Heather. So thinking about compliance monitoring and what to expect over the next year, you know, the biggest thing that we really want to um, plan on doing and, and share with you is the idea of working together as a team. We all play very important roles in this process. Yourself as providers, starting points leaders, community partners like resource development specialists or Vermont Northern Lights, licensing staff, um, parents. And so it's important that as a team really working together with the implementation of these regulations, that we're very mindful about who we're seeking what support or guidance from. So if you have a question about, you know, you need to develop a policy or a procedure or a practice in your program and you want a, some support around developing that, you know, your mentors or um, resource development specialists would are examples of good people to go to who are going to be able to tell you about research and best practices. And by having that information, you'll really be able to decide what you want to do in your program. If you really have you're in a moment where you're feeling frustrated and you really want to connect with somebody who's going to understand where you're coming from um, and be able to provide that moral support. You know, maybe when you want to contact your starting point leader. Maybe you want to sit down and read rules together with somebody and not sit down by yourself and they need to read them too. And so that's a great resource to utilize. If you really um, 
have a question about a licensing process, procedure, or a licensing rule, you really want to make sure you're calling the licensor on duty line and um, getting that guidance from us. So we all play an important role in this process, and it's important that we work together um, in this. With that being said, we were receiving a lot of questions around achieving compliance. And a lot of people are really focusing on how can they achieve compliance by September 1st. And that's really unrealistic. It's unrealistic to think that everyone's going to achieve compliance by September 1st. And licensing is certainly not expecting that. We know that it's going to take the next year for everybody to come into compliance with these rules. And so our focus right now is on training, um, having you think about, you know, have you read the rules? Have you read them a second time? Sometimes even a third time gives you a different perspective. It helps you build familiarness with it. Um, start thinking about highlighting which rules you might want to do something about. Maybe there's some action that needs to be taken on your part. Maybe you need to purchase something. Um, and then thinking about what the plan will be. How are you going to achieve compliance? Where can, what can you get started with immediately? What might need more time? and think about what that looks like and really give yourself time to work through that. As we're doing compliance visits over the next year, we really are going to be seeing those as educational opportunities. So if we see things that aren't fully in compliance, we're going to be having conversations about that. The things that we'd be citing as non-compliance are going to be your standard things that, you know, you know you need to use positive guidance practices and if you not doing that, we would still need to cite that. Um, you know, basic cleanliness still needs to happen. If you're not following the exact schedule yet and you're struggling with a component and how to, how to put that last couple pieces into the place for the schedule, that's going to be something that we can talk about and support you. And we might even have some ideas, especially um, having come from other programs and see like, oh, they were struggling with this, here's a suggestion of what they did. So we'll be teaming in that way. So I think the biggest thing to remember is that this is really going to be a process and one that we're doing together. Okay. So Crystal, I'm just going to stop for just a second. I've seen several questions come in related to training that's required, the fundamentals, the level certificates. And I want to let everyone know we'll try to circle back to questions, but some specific questions specific to your situation, it's best if we can get them in the frequently asked questions. I will receive a transcript of all of the questions asked tonight, and I can actually submit them into our frequently asked questions so that you can look for them answered there, um, just so that we can continue moving on and we're not holding you beyond the time of our training. Um, we also have a question about resources, and I know that's a piece that Crystal will get to sooner, soon in the presentation. So we want to take some time to really talk about some tips around reading licensing rules. And so you can see that there's going to be three things that we're going to focus on here. The table of contents for this regulation, definitions, and something we've labeled what it says it means. Um, so I hope people have a copy of the regulations handy. I think it's helpful if you do have it handy, if you could open it up and open it up to the beginning where it says table of contents. At the top of that page, it says mission, and it says the mission of the Child Development Division is to improve the well-being of Vermont's children. We do this through partnerships with families, communities, schools, providers, state and federal agencies that increase access to high-quality, sustainable child development services. And underneath it says table of contents. So when you think about beginning to use this book as a tool and the different aspects within this book, um, to help you understand the licensing rules, the table of contents is a key component. And what you see here under section one is it says introduction. And when you look to see the couple things that are within that, it starts right off with the legal authority to regulate services. If we don't start there, nothing else has a basis. So this is really the most macro level view, the biggest view that we can take on these licensing rules. And it talks about, you know, in section one, the effective dates and how those apply. So we start right off with this, this big, broad view, 
introduction and go into section two, which says general provisions. And if you look at the kinds of things that fall within general provisions, you see it talks about definitions, licensing processes and procedures, um, and various specific kinds of sections like rule variance and public record of violations. This section here, section two, is now it's starting to be a little bit more about narrow it down just a little bit more. So section one, that the most broadest perspective. Section two is starting to look at licensing, what to expect from us, how to understand the rules with definitions, and some basic license rules. One thing that is important to note is that in the current registered home regulations, this section is six pages. If you look here, in the new rules, it's about 25 pages. We definitely spent some time putting a lot more information in here so that you know what to expect from us. So that is um, you know, an important thing to notice. The next section is section three, administration and operation. And you can start to see here that it's talking about things like notifying notifications of child care licensing, um, emergency preparedness, confidentiality, program management, and record keeping. So now that we've kind of talked about licensing and those kinds of processes, now we're really talking about the program and the operation of the program and the program as a whole. And so the kinds of things that relate to that you're going to find in Section 3. And before we get too much further into this book, you see that Section 4 takes some time to really look at how the program's engaging with families and parents. And this section talks about pre-enrollment visits, conferences, communication, activities to encourage family involvement. So we're beginning to see how this table of contents in this book is lined up to start at your biggest level and then bring it down to looking at the program as a whole, now looking at the program's relationship with families. And when you turn the page of the table of contents and look at section five, not only is it probably one of our largest sections, um, but it's all about health, safety, and nutrition. So it's looking now more specifically at the program. And when you think about health, you know, it's the child's health, sleep habits, administration of medications. When you think of safety, it's talking about you know, first aid kits, it's talking about the environment and how space is set up, um, and then nutrition, food and nutrition for children. So you start to get a more specific look at a certain component of the program. And then you talk, look at section six, which is teaching and learning, which is, a, is your curriculum, and how you're interacting with children, and um, ratios. And all of that's going to fall into section six, and you start to see that it starts to get very, very specific. And now that we've really outlined the program, we come to Section 7, which is about program personnel and staffing. Who needs background checks? What's that process look like? Qualifications, annual professional development. And that's really coming down to, now that you have the program in place and you understand all the rules for that, you know, who, who needs to do what within the program. And not to stop there, because you have Appendix A and Appendix B, which is just as much a part of this whole document as the table of context content, excuse me. So Appendix A is on signs and symptoms of, of illness chart. For licensed homes, this is not a new chart, um, although it has been updated. So you will want to read through it because some things have um, been modified based on latest research and health practices. And then um, Appendix B is some guidance around crib safety and meeting compliance with the Public Safety Commission on that. So that's a little bit about the table of contents and, and what it does. So are you OK if I interrupt you for a minute for yep. some questions, Crystal? OK, yes, so please. we have some that are cycling back to our last slide. And I have some um, questions around confirming what you're saying is that programs don't need to be completely in compliance for one year. Is that correct? Right. We are saying that we're going to work with programs over the next year. OK. And then, um, so if something's not in compliance, will it be recorded in BSIS as a violation? It will depend on what the issue is. Um, you know, when we are talking about cleanliness, cleanliness has always been a rule. 
if we're seeing um, you know, food stains on the walls and cobwebs hanging from the ceilings, um, and, and those are the kinds of things we would normally cite as a violation for cleanliness, we may still need to cite that. Um, there is expected to be a basic level of cleanliness. What we will be flexible on is when we're talking specifically about how you're doing with meeting the, the schedule that now has been outlined. That's where we expect people might need some support and guidance and reassurance. Um, so, you know, you really need to look at it from both perspectives. Okay. And so another question is, will there be forms available to the providers for everything CDD is expecting providers to use and have on hand? So we'll come back to the forms piece because it's part of what we cover in our resources. Um, people don't need to wait for the forms because we, we don't prescribe what's used. So if you have your own form or you know, people come together and work to create their own, that's perfectly fine. We will be creating forms and posting it to our website. Um, so you just referenced the cleaning schedule and we just received a question about what schedule are you actually referring to? So there's rules around what needs to be cleaned when, and those are the rules I'm referring to, and they're in Section 5. Now that we've talked about table of contents, we want to focus on the definition section specifically. The definition section is a really important section within this regulation. And one of the things to know is here's one place where we really spent some time adding. So in the registered home regulations, currently there's 24 definitions. And in this set, there's 57. So you can see that we've more than doubled them. There's a couple key things that are important to know about the definition section. If you can look the word up in the dictionary, and that's the definition we're using, then we didn't purposely put it in this section. We're using the dictionary. If you couldn't look the word up in the dictionary and fully understand it because we're using it in a way that's unique to this profession, those are the words that we tried to capture and write in this definition section. So the other thing that's also important to keep in mind is that it's a definition. It's not a licensing rule. So we are receiving some frequently asked questions that say, you know, well, I, I looked at the definition for partner staff, and it doesn't tell me whether or not that they can be left alone with children. And the reason for that is because there are rules about who can count in ratio and who can be left alone with children, and that would be in Section 6. Um, the definition just tells you who we can, you know, what kind of person we consider a partner staff. So the definition helps you understand how to read a rule and, and apply it, um, but it is not a rule in and of itself. So when we're, I want to circle back around and talk again about rule uh, definitions that are in here versus not in here. So there's a term in the licensing rules that refers to substantial compliance. Substantial compliance is a legal term, and if you type it into a you know, Google search for a dictionary, it'll give you the definition, and that's the definition we're using, which is why it's not in here. But let's look at the word sensory. Anybody that has a regulation open, if you can find the definition for sensory and just type into the chat box what page you're on, that would be great. Page six. Great. Thank you. Right at the bottom of page 6, it's Rule 2243. And I'll stop there and just point out that you notice I'm not saying 2.2.43. I'm using it as whole numbers. So I say the 2, I say the 2, and then I say 43 as a whole number. And it's a lot easier to refer to the rules that way. So we look at the definition for sensory, and it says means the intentional and concrete means of supporting each child's individual learning style by providing opportunities to learn through the five senses. If we look this word sensory up in the dictionary, that's not what it says. And you can see how it's specific to our profession and how it would relate to curriculum. And if you go to the curriculum section in, in section six, any rules that talk about sensory, um, you could look back at this definition and it's going to help you understand what's expected. So that's just an example of, um, you know, a word that is in the definition section versus another word that might not be, and just clarity around um, definitions aren't licensing rules in and of themselves. So you definitely need to find the rules that apply. 
that are using those words. And I can't say enough how helpful and important it is to use the definitions. Um, there's been many times when um, you know, we're talking with somebody about a licensing rule and we look up a word in the definitions and it feels like an aha moment. So definitely use that section. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is, is cover this last piece called what it says it means. If a rule doesn't say it, it can't mean it. And it really can be that simple sometimes. So let's look at um, three rules, three different kinds of rules, and focus on what they say and what they mean. The first one is rule 333. And it says the family child care provider shall establish a, establish a system for taking attendance, including documentation of the time when every child arrives and departs each day he or she attends the family child care home. The family child care provider shall save all daily attendance records identifying the hours of children's attendance for at least 12 months from the date that children that care is provided. So when we start looking at this rule, right off the bat we see this phrase, establish a system. And people start asking, you know, well, what does that system need to look like? We didn't say in the rule what the system needed to look like. So you have the flexibility to develop a system that works for you. Um, some people choose to develop paper systems. Other people choose to use electronic systems. As long as your system has the components required within this rule, then it's a system that you're allowed to use. And the requirements in this rule really talk about documenting the time when each child arrives and leaves each day and that you can keep the records for 12 months. Another thing you might notice within this rule is that it doesn't say who has to document it. Um, ultimately, the family child care provider is responsible for ensuring compliance to this rule. Some programs might choose to have their parents sign the children in and out on the attendance form. Other programs will choose to do that themselves. Um, and, and different people have different reasons why they choose one way over the other. Um, sometimes people choose to have parents do it because it's easier for them. Um, other times people tend to have parents do it because if something ever happened and they wanted to be able to remember who dropped off on that day or who picked up on that day, they can look back at the attendance and they can see that. Um, so that's an example where it doesn't say that parents have to do it, so um, that would be your choice if you wanted to have a program where you ask parents to do that. The other thing that's important when you're reading a rule is making sure you read the whole rule. The first sentence really tells you what you need to know around what you're documenting. The second sentence becomes important because it tells you how long you need to keep the record. Um, and remember that this is a licensing rule, so this is how long you would need to keep this attendance for licensing purposes. You may be participating in the financial assistance program or food program, or you may be talking to your tax preparer or accountant, and those different um, entities or programs or people might have different requirements or guidelines of what you need to follow. So this is for licensing. Your tax preparer may tell you to keep it for seven years. Um, the food program might tell you to keep it for three years. So who you need to keep it for the longest will be, you know, something you might want to be thinking about. But just understand that this rule is licensing's rule. Um, so we have received a question specific to this rule, and that is, do the sign-in, sign-out sheets need to be separate for each family? Well, again, I'll, I will come back to that's a great question because it really reinforces our point. It doesn't say one way or the other, so you have the flexibility to decide how you want to develop that system. Okay. Um, so we have received a couple questions um, specific to the what a written notice would be. The first question, I'm going to actually just kind of combine them. The first question was about if written notification when a child may be exposed to a reportable communicable disease. Can a text count as a written notification? And the second question was very, very similar. And that's if a child gets a minor injury, can a text be counted as a written notice to the family? I don't have that licensing rule in front of me. Um, one of the things I think about when I hear a question like that 
is how can you document it later if you need to show that you provide written, if the rule says you provided written notification, how can you show that you provided that documentation? So that's something to remember when you're developing what system. And if you have a particular um, format that you want to utilize, you know, that would be something that would be great to contact at the licensor on duty line and ask them, like, this is what I'm thinking. Is there anything I might not be, re you know, remembering or connecting to that I should also be taking into consideration? If time in and time out are recorded with the food program, is that okay? And how is we, how would a provider need to provide it to licensing if needed? So licensing will look at documentation in whatever format you have it. Um, if you're utilizing another recording system like the food program, um, you want to be mindful that you, it needs to be available um, for review by licensing upon request. So you want to make sure that you can do that. And you want to make sure you can do it for the full 12 months that potentially would be asked to be seen. So making sure that you really understand if you're using another system like the food program, is it really kept for that long? Can you really pull it up? How would you pull it up? You'd want to educate yourself on those things before you decided whether or not that um, system would work. Okay. Um. So one question was if they could use the the book that Red Leaf Press puts out, is that okay? It's a calendar keeper is the official name of it. So there's lots of different systems. Um, and you want to come back to, does the system give you an opportunity to document the child's name, the date they were there, the time of arrival and departure time for the day, and does it allow you to um, maintain that documentation for 12 months? As long as those pieces are met, then that sounds like a viable system, a system that works. Um, and a final question probably on this one is, I have daily reports for all of my children. Should I be keeping a copy of these sheets for all the children or just the ones that would have any of my written documentation? I'm going to ask that person to kind of clarify what they mean by that, and I'll circle back around to that question. I'm not sure I understand really what when you say, or if it documents, or only specific documentation, I'm not sure what you'd be referring to. Okay. And while they're clarifying that, can we move on to the next rule, and will you let me know when they've had a chance to mm -hmm. say a little bit more? Thank I will. You. Thank you for asking that question, and thank you for following back up with us. So the next rule I want to take a look at that's a little bit different is 510.313. And this rule says that the outdoor play area shall be fenced or otherwise protected from traffic and other hazards. Fencing or natural barriers such as hedges or other clear land boundaries shall prevent children from exiting and allow for safe supervision of outdoor play. So one of the things that we can notice right off the bat with this particular rule is that it doesn't say everybody has to have a fence. It talks about when fences would be required, and it talks about fences as one option. And so if you look at the first line, it says fenced or otherwise protected. So when you're reading a rule, the word and and the word or are very key words. If the word and is used, it means whatever comes before the and and whatever comes after the and, both have to be um, met. When you look at the word or, it means you have a choice. Um, it could be a fence or, in this instance, an otherwise protected means. Now, this is a great example where you think you might have what you need in the first sentence, but when you read the second sentence, you get a lot more clarity. And it talks about fencing or natural barriers, and it gives you examples, such as hedges or other clear land boundaries. It also tells you what those boundaries need to accomplish. They need to pre prevent children from exiting and allow for safe supervision of outdoor play. So to start to determine whether or not you need a fence, you first need to assess what hazards exist in the outside play area. And hazards that are common for us to see are things like pools, rivers, train tracks. And in Vermont, that might also mean electric fences and farm animals. Um, 
So you want to take a look at what hazards may exist. Some hazards come and go. I, the common one I think of are pools. Um, you, know, you might not have any hazards, might not need a fence, and then after several years you decide to install a pool. And now there's a pool that children need to be protected from. Um, that might be one example. Or maybe you've decided to get some goats um, and put up some fencing um, to protect children from the goats. And, or protect the goats from the children, depending on <laughs> how, you, <laughs> how you look at it. Um, so it's not just assessing hazards one time when you first get licensed. It's assessing hazards over time and how you might change the space. Whenever anyone does any changing of space, whether it's indoor or outdoor, you should always call the licensor on duty line before you make those changes. They'll help you kind of think through what things you might want to be mindful of. If you think you've thought it all through, they'll hear you out, and they'll really be able to affirm, confirm that you are all set, or they will maybe point out a couple things you might not have thought of. If you're um, adding on to your space, especially inside, that needs to be reviewed during a technical assistance visit and approved for use before you can use it with your child care program. So definitely partner um, with licensing by calling the licensor on duty line and talking about changes and making sure that there's nothing you need to be mindful of. Once you establish that there is one or two or more hazards that you need to be protecting children from, then you need to think about how is best to do that. A fence is one option, but there might be natural barriers. Um, as long as it prevents children from exiting and allows for safe supervision outdoors, um, that natural barrier might be sufficient, like a hedge line. That's a great example of one. Okay, so we have received some questions specific to this rule. The first, I think you actually might have just addressed, but it is, um, around natural barriers and would hedges or trees be considered natural, an appropriate barrier? It might be, yep. Um, the next question would be, if I had a natural barrier that was okay before, do I need one now, a new one now? Well, if it, if it still is, if it's still a sufficient barrier, it still meets the rule. So this person's having a hard time getting through to fence companies because it's a busy time of year for them. Do they, does this person need to have an extension to get the fence or can um, they assume that they have a year to get this taken care of? That is an excellent question. I'm really glad this question was asked. Um, you do have a year to come into compliance, especially a rule around a fence if you feel like um, there's hazards that a fence is needed for. Um, nobody needs to be applying for a variance to a rule um, at this point. You really have this year to come up with your plan and develop it. When you get towards the end, you know, about a month before September 1st of 2017, if you find that there's like one rule that you're still working on achieving compliance to and you need, you know, two or three more months before you, you have been able to achieve compliance, that's when you want to submit the variance request. Um, earlier this afternoon we were having this conversation and, and someone said, so I don't need to request any variances. Well, I can't go quite that far to say you wouldn't need any variance between now and September 1st of 2017, because there might be a situation. Um, so if you think you might need one, call the licensor on duty line and run the scenario by them. They'll give you guidance and um, help you with that. And if you feel like if there's a particular hazard, waiting a year might be problematic. So having calling the licensor on duty line and really talking about what can I be doing? What should this look like? What do you? What do we give you for suggestions and guidance around that? Um, let's really partner so that you're not in this on your own, trying to figure out what to do and whether or not your plan is sufficient. Okay. So there were a couple questions about above ground pools, and if the ladder is not on the pool um, mm -hmm. and it's a four foot tall above ground pool, would a fence around the pool be necessary? That is a really tricky question because that really de depends on 
who you're serving, and what age groups, and the height. Um, some children um, are pretty average. Some children are really tall. Um, if there is not a means for the children to gain access to the pool, then a fence may not be necessary. Um, it would mean that the ladder is not in, you know, like you mentioned in your question. Um, it, and it may be something that changes over time. If you start starting to serve older and older children and they're, you've got some pretty tall ones, that might be a different conversation. So how many exits are required on a fence? So there is a licensing rule that talks about what if, what if you're installing a rule a fence after September 1st, and you would want to look at that rule and read the requirements for what a fence should or shouldn't have. And they're in that same section, so 5, 10, 3, 1. Um, so I would encourage you to go to that section and read those. Um, so does this rule eliminate all driveway play? No. Okay. That was a very simple question or answer to mm -hmm. that question. <laughs> uh, what is a good source for playground protection for play areas that are above three feet? I think cushioning protection, mm -hmm. cushioning material. I'm sorry, can you read the question again? Above three feet through me. Uh, so play areas that are above three feet, what would be a good source of playground protection, like playground cushioning material? I would really consult um, somebody that sells cushioning uh, material for playgrounds. Um, you might even look at the Public Playground Safety Handbook. Um, I mean, they're the experts on that. Uh, so, a couple of clarifying questions about existing fences. The existing fences will not need to be modified, is that correct? That's my understanding. Because the, the rule that talks about um, what a fence has to look like, is that it specifically starts with the language fencing installed after the effective date. So, it's not requiring existing fences to be changed. But there is a rule that says um, fences need to be sturdy and safe and, um, and to, you know, serve their purpose. So if your fence um, is in disrepair, thank you, um, that will need to be addressed. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, and we also have just a suggestion for the audience from one provider, and that's that you may also, these are licensing rules, but you may also want to check with your insurance company about your pool and the child care and their coverage. Um, so that was just a suggestion from, from the up provider. Um, so we, um, so can children still play in the driveway on riding toys, on riding toys since it's outside of the barrier area? So there's no rule that says the only place to be outside is within a fenced-in area. So there are times when you're going to have organized riding play, or you might use your pool uh, with the children, or you might go for a walk, um, or you might be exploring in the woods. So just be mindful that there's no rule that says every time you're outside you can only be in the fenced-in area. What you do want to make sure is wherever you are, children are protected from hazards and you're able to uh, maintain that safety. So if you're trying to do ride on toys in the driveway and children are running all over the place and it's hard to contain them, it may be a time when you want to stop particip that particular activity for a later time um, when children are able to cooperate or um, so. Okay. So um, I think we have a few other very, very specific questions if we want to move on and then we'll circle back around if we have time. Okay. So the, the last rule that I want to take a look at is Rule 61513. And this rule starts off with an introductory section and then it has multiple bullets. So 
So when we read the introductory section, it says children under 24 months of age shall experience frequent positive interactions with a consistent licensed family child care provider and or staff member that provides each child with the following opportunities throughout the day. So when you're reading this, if something is in non-compliance in this introductory sentence, so a key piece of this introductory sentence is consistent licensed family child care provider and or staff member. If there isn't excuse me, a consistent um, adult working with children, we would be citing that as non-compliance. That's an example of when we would cite this rule as a non-compliance. If that's in compliance, and then we're assessing the various bullets, they start off with face-to-face -face interaction, being held and carried, individual and parallel play. As you go down through those bullets, all of those things are required because they're in the rule. We wouldn't be citing non-compliance, though, unless more than 50% of those bullets were missing um, and they were not occurring. So that's something to be mindful of. Yes, they're all required. If we see some that are missing, we might bring it to the provider's attention when we're debriefing, um, but we wouldn't be citing it as a violation unless more than 50% of those bullets are missing. Now, one of the things that we talked about in this afternoon session is that this particular rule, this particular rule is um, boxed. And what that means is that it applies to licensed homes only. So I just want to acknowledge that this is a licensed home specific um, rule. And I'm just using it as an example here to really talk about the difference between um, how licensing would assess compliance to a rule where there's an intro and bullet. So there was a question about if the, this rule specifically applies to the provider's own children. Um, no, there's nothing that says it specifically applies. It just talks about the children as a whole. Oh, so there's some clarification about it applying to the provider's own children. And it's, the question was actually more general than this rule, and it's about the whole regulations themselves. Do they apply to the provider's own children as well as the children um, in their own care? That would really be a question that I would feel more comfortable putting in as a frequently asked question because in order for me to really answer that rule, I would need to reread all the various rules to see how they interconnect with each other, and um, I don't feel comfortable trying to answer that question without really having a chance to read the rules from that perspective. Is that a question that we would bring forward for them when you said you would get a transcript? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So this question is, do all the rules in boxes apply only to licensed homes? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so it looks like the remaining questions are about other regulations. Are you at a point? So let's move on with the presentation, and then we, again, I apologize, but we'll circle back when we have time, or I will be submitting to them to the frequently asked questions. Great, thank you. So. We want to spend some time talking about resources. Um, there is multiple different resources um, that are available that will help build compliance towards these rules. And they include the Child, Child Development Division ourselves, local community child care support agencies, um, registered nurse child care wellness consultants, Vermont First to Five, Vermont Community Loan Fund, Vermont Northern Light. Um, so we want to go to the Child Development Division website. We're going to pull it up here for you. And on our website, under the Frequently Asked Questions section, so here you see our website. If you scroll down under General Questions, you'll see where it says New at the end, and that's how you know that this is a new posting from when we originally posted this about a week ago. Um, and you click on that, and it brings you to the section of the rules, of the 
frequently asked questions, excuse me, it says, what resources are available to help me with this, with the regulations? And at the end of this, there's a link, and if you click on that, it shares with you various resources. So if we start with the Child Development Division, our website has um, the link to regulations. So if you want an electronic version or you want to send an electronic version to families, you can send them that link. Um, if you want to keep track of frequently asked question responses that will help you uh, as you're learning these rules and figuring out what you want to be doing in your program, you want to utilize that section of our website and new postings will be happening. We will send out notices when new things are posted. Um, and um, and it'll be marked, so you'll be able to tell which, which is newer postings on there. Our licensing newsletters come out about quarterly, and they're posted to our website as well. And um, starting with this past news list, summer newsletter, they are searchable, so you'll be able to pull up old things. And our licensing newsletter is an important means for us to be able to communicate with providers around what's happening, trends that we're seeing, um, we will share updates that are happening around trainings, and there's all sorts of information that we share in that. That's our ongoing communication with you separate from our emails. So definitely utilize that as a resource. Someone asked about forms earlier. We do have a section of our website that is forms, and we will be developing sample forms for various things outlined in these rules. And as we develop them, we'll be posting them there. And you're, you're more than welcome to create your own. You're welcome to pull a form from that sample list and use it as it is. You're also welcome to pull it and change it because you want it to look slightly different or you want additional information on there. So you can use those forms any way that best meets your needs. Then we have a section on grants. So if you're looking to take courses um, and you need some support with funding, there's some grant money available to help you with that. So you can look at that section of our website. Um, there's a whole section of our website on professional development. There's a whole section on health and safety guidance and resources. And then we certainly have the licensure on duty line. I can't stress enough how helpful it'll be. And starting September 1st, we always have one licensor every day that's answering calls. Starting September 1st, we will have two licensors to answer questions and calls, whether it's from parents or providers or whoever the calls may be from. And um, we definitely want to try to meet that call volume that we're anticipating. Separate from our, uh, from our Child Development Division, there's the local community child care support agencies. You might know them as your local resource agency. And the resource development specialists in those agencies are really well equipped to help you with knowing and learning about what professional development opportunities exist, um, helping you think about what you want to do with your professional development, what, you, what your goals are and how to meet them. Developing quality policies and procedures is something that they can help you with. So they'll talk about what's best practice or what research supports and help you think about what you want to implement in your program. They'll link you to additional resources. And like I said before, there's copies of licensing regulations there if that's needed. Um, if you're working with them on developing a policy or procedure and you have a question about how it will relate to the licensing rule, you'll want to stop and call the licensor on duty line and get that guidance. And then you'll continue working through what you want your policy or procedure to be with the resource development specialist. The registered nurse child care wellness consultants um, are also a valuable resource. You're familiar with calling 911 in an emergency. Well, Vermont has a service called 211. So if you dial 211, um, you're going to get uh, a support network. Uh, and they can provide support and guidance on a whole array of topics well beyond what would be relevant to us. But you can call them and request to a referral for a resource, a registered nurse child care wellness consultant, and they will set that up. If you participate in the STARS program, the wellness consultant is a free service for you. And they provide education and support with developing health and safety policies and procedures. And we've touched on the few that they advertise in their handouts around safe cleaning, emergency planning, um, managing infection, health and safety policy development, 
promoting healthy eating and physical activity and safe sleep. So that is a, a helpful resource. Next we have on here Vermont Birth to Five. There's several resources that they provide. And they go, their services go beyond this, but as it pertains to the new regulations, they provide mentoring for centers and homes. So you can seek out that service. They also provide professional development and support around professional development planning. They also had shared services. Um, and that's an opportunity. If you're participating in STARS and working with Vermont Birth to Five, you can access their shared services. And this is a place where you're going to receive resources and tools to support your business and program. So they might have um, a variety of handbooks that you could utilize and, and not have to start your handbook from scratch. There might also be discounts. So for example, and I'm going to make this example up, but they might have worked on an arrangement where if providers um, are signing up for child care liability insurance through their website, through a particular service provider, it might be at a discounted rate because the volume is higher because there's many people that are doing it together and so the um, in insurance carrier is able to give a discount. So there may be other services like that where you do it through the website and you would get a discounted rate. So it would be a cost savings. So that's something to look for, look into. And the last resource we, not the last one, the second to last one is the Vermont Community Loan Fund. Um, they provide, again, like these other resources, many, many more services than what we have bulleted here, but these are the two that pertain to the new licensing regulations. And the first one is a free business planning support. So you're working on purchasing cushioning for your swing set, underneath your swing set. And you're trying to figure out how you're going to be able to afford it and when you might be able to afford it. And you want, and, and you'd like some support around that. You can call them up. Their service is free to, to help you with this. They'd help you look at your income and your expenses and how to project out your budget. They might even be able to support you with, you know, how to approach the research to know where to get the best pricing. That's one example of how their free business planning support might be of help to you. The other thing is that they do f provide financial funding, so low interest child care loans um, to help with various expenses. So that's another resource. And the last one on this list is Vermont, Vermont Northern Lights. So one of the things they do is enter qualifications, resumes, and professional development into people's BFIS quality and credential accounts. So if you're trying to get something uploaded into that and you have questions about what's needed or what they, um, what rules apply for documentation, they'd be able to support you with that. They also support, um, provide guidance and support around individualized prof professional development planning as well as guidance and applications for the career ladder. So if you want to understand your level certificate and does it meet um, you know, what does level one mean versus level two, do what you already have for um, education or training history, meet a certain level certificate, they'll help you figure all that out. Um, if you've reached level two and you want to get to level three, they'll help talk with you about what ways you could pursue that and what will help you with that. And they also have information on professional development opportunities as well. So this is on our website and this becomes a really helpful tool because it starts to talk about what financial sources are there to support you, your process, uh, what kinds of support services around qualifications and professional development, um, sample forms. So please, you know, encourage people to go to this portion of our website and, and seek out some of these services if you haven't already been utilizing them. Okay, so um, I'm going to get back to a couple of the questions. And i got to find them. Sorry, everybody. Um, so if I'm a registered home now, if I'm a registered home, does that mean I'm a licensed home now or am I still a family and child care provider? That's a great question. Um, we call everyone that has a license a licensed program. Um, when you're talking about family child care homes, though, there's two different types of um, family child care homes. There's registered homes. Um, and there's licensed homes. So if you're currently a registered home, you would be a, reg you know, after September 1st, you'd still be a registered home. 
Um, so I did receive a question specific to the training hours for this webinar. And that is if you're going to need to submit, providers will need to submit this to Northern Lights, or if we will be submitting it, and CDD will be submitting it to Northern Lights for, on your behalf, um, probably early next week to be entered into your BFIS credential account. Um, I will also be sending you certificates of attendance um, for the training hours as well. So we did receive some really specific questions. Um, and so maybe we could generally give some information. Um, we may not be able to answer all of the specifics to each person's situation. So the first, I've, I've received lots of questions about the qualifications for helpers in registered home provider program. And it's actually the question started around our fundamentals conversation and the level of certificate uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving to that section of the book. Um, so it's section 7.3 and it starts on page 88 and it talks about the qualifications needed for a family child care provider. So let's just look at that one and talk about it and apply the tips we've talked about earlier on how to read a licensing rule. So if you look at the introduction, because this is one of those rules, and I apologize, let me go to the rule. Can you actually pull it up off of our website, Heather? It's rule 731 on page 88. So those of you who have your books open, if you want to flip to that, it's rule 731. And there's an intro, and then there's bullets. So the intro reads, a registered family child care provider that operates a registered family child care home shall ensure and maintain documentation that she or he is at least 18 years of age, is a high school graduate, or has completed a GED, and meets one of the following qualifications prior to licensure or within 12 months of initial licensure. So there's a couple of key components of this. You see that a list of items are being identified. So 18 high school graduate or GED. So it means one or the other, either a high school diploma or a GED. And then it uses the word and. So you have to be 18 and have a high school um, diploma or a GED and meet or exceed one of the following qualifications. And then there's the bullet. Thank you, Heather, for finding that. For anyone that doesn't have the book, you can look on your screen now and you can see where we're reading. So when you look at the bullet, after each bullet it says or. And what that means is these are options. You could have the first bullet after 12 months from life, or you could have the second bullet, or you could have the third, or the fourth, or the fifth. Any one of those would be the third thing you would need after being licensed for 12 months. Or in this place, you're already an existing license program, so it would be a year from September 1st of 2016. So that's how you read this rule. You look at the, the intro section, and you see that there's three things that it's requiring because it has an and. And then you see the bullets, and at the end of each of them, it says an or, so you know that you get to choose which one you want to, to meet it. If you have a long history of professional development and you've been a provider for many years, you may want to start with contacting Northern Lights and find out how to apply for a level one certificate. You might already have everything you need. Um, and they'll be able to help guide you with that. So here's an example with using your tips on how to read the rule, and then going to your resources and knowing where maybe to start with, you know, Northern Lights, um, because you're looking at a potential career ladder certificate, and they would help you look at your background and see whether you meet that. If you meet it, all you have to do is apply for it, and you, you've met the criteria if you're 18 and also have a high school diploma or a GED. So it could be that simple. Okay. Um, and so related to that is training hours and if college courses 
count as training hour. So when I go to the professional development section, we turn the page and go to page 90. And I'm going to ask Heather to scroll down to rule 744. Thank you, Heather. And it says, all staff, with the exception of substitutes, shall complete 15 clock hours of annual professional development activities as required in the rule 742 of these regulations. So this is a rule that refers to another rule. So in order to fully understand it, you have to go read Rule 742, which is right up above. And it says, that rule says, the family child care provider and staff shall be actively engaged in professional development activities as specified in their individualized professional development plan. So you need to have a plan. What you're doing for professional development has to meet what you're saying your goals are and what your needs are for a professional to grow and improve within your profession. And 744 says you need to do 15 clock hours. So a college course, it, you know, a credit is worth so many hours. And you certainly could take a college course. If you took one three-credit college course, you would exceed the 15 clock hour requirement. Um, if you want to know whether or not the course you would like to take, you know, is acceptable, you would want to contact Vermont Northern Lights and find out what the criteria are for it to be acceptable. And they'll let you know, you know, things like what is the minimum grade, um, you know, what would be needed for documentation, you know, they'll talk about whether or not it needs to be from an accredited college. If it's an online class, they'll talk about what standards it needs to meet. So they'll be able to, if you want to make sure it's something that would be accepted before you take it, you can run it by Northern Mike. Okay, so let's um, just switch gears, and I did receive a few questions um, around a couple different, a couple other topics, so if we can get, because there were so many questions about that. Um, the first one is around over-the-counter medications. Do they need to be in a lockbox? And um, providers are unable to find it in the regulations, but it needs to be in a lockbox. However, the medication training did um, state that it should be in a locked box or covered. Mm. I love this question because this question really starts to look at what's considered a minimum standard that licensing would require and then what's best practice. So you're going to go to workshops and trainings and they're going to tell you what research is and they're going to tell you what best practice is. And you need to decide whether or not you want to achieve that best practice or whether or not you just want to meet the minimum standard. So this is your great question because it, it draws you back to, well, what does the licensing rule require so you understand what the basic requirement is? So this is where I'm going to show a little bit of my naiveness as I flip through the book to find where we're talking about. And I think I found it. So. Um, I'm looking in section 5-6, so if you have your books open and you move to section 5-6, it's administration of medication. I'm going to skim some of these rules. You didn't lose us, anybody. We're just looking for the rule. As you can tell, we're even becoming familiar with them, so we can't just quickly just flip right to that regulation and quote it off the top of our heads. So I believe I found the rule that would speak to this, and it would be Rule 5611. And I think someone found it faster than I did, so yay for you. Thank you for sharing it with us. It's Rule 45, and this is where the teaming is going to be really important and helpful, because we are all learning this together. So Rule 5611 on page 45, and Heather's pulled it up on the screen, says the family child care provider shall ensure that all medication and non-medication described in Rule 5610 of these regulations shall be securely, and be securely stored and inaccessible to children. So what we, what we have prescribed or required in this rule is that they're securely stored and inaccessible to children. 
Now, if you went to a training and they said the best way to do that is a lockbox, and they told you a certain kind of lockbox to use, that certainly meets the rule. That doesn't mean it's the only option. So there is a variety of ways to ensure that these items are securely stored and inaccessible to children. And this is not a new rule. You've always had to have these things um, securely stored and inaccessible. So most everybody should already be in compliance with this with the variety of systems that you're already using. And if you haven't then, um, if it wasn't secured properly, like say it was on the counter within reach of children, we probably have already cited a violation for that and, and educated about that. Um, but this rule just clearly spells it out. It makes it its own rule. It's not the one that is like the kitchen sink where everything's in the same rule. They're all broken down and, and they're in their individual rules. And this is an example. But here's where you can find it. So we received several questions about back about the training hours and registration year. So first with clarification around what the expectation is for training hours. Is it six hours or 15 hours for this current re-registration, especially for those that are re-registering in September or October? Are they expected to have six hours or 15 hours for that re-registration? So you can't meet a requirement that didn't exist at the time. And I think that's important to remember. So your, your registration year, if you're renewing in September or October, um, you were required to have six hours, and that's what we'd be assessing for. And that's true. There's going to be a variety of rules, um, like the um, orientation rule that's required. There's going to be a variety of rules that we are still developing um, trainings or um, resources for. And so if we, fingerprinting is another one, we're, we're working on implementing our fingerprinting process. If we haven't provided it to you, like the orientation training or the fingerprinting um, documents, um, you can't be in compliance with something we haven't provided to you. So rest assured, as we develop it, we will provide it and we'll work with you to come into compliance. Um, so I have one last piece that we'll get to, and then we're going to move so that on, since we have three minutes left to our training. And that is um, back to 5611. Somebody pointed out that it's actually referring to 5610. Um, and so that is really if you want to address like what 5610 relates to 5611 and how they are separate. but mm -hmm. yeah. So 5611 starts off with saying ensure that all medication, that's medication, that's one thing. And then it says and non-medications described in the rule 5610, that's something else. And that's how they fit together. They're talking about two different things. And when, it, when we were naming non-medications, we wanted people to know things like bug repellent, sunscreen, non-prescription, diaper ointment. We wanted them to know that when we said non-medications, we meant those things. So those are, so we meant medications and non-medications related to 5, 6, uh, 10. So I know that we're receiving lots of additional questions, um, and unfortunately we are running out of time, so we're going to um, kind of wrap mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So. Just to review, you know, our goal today was really to give you a sense of what the implementation plan will look like. Uh, we want people to kind of really settle in, take time to read your rules, become familiar with them, think about how you're going to develop a plan, and start working on that plan. We also wanted to give you some tips about how to read licensing rules, and a lot of your questions have given us an opportunity tonight to really practice with how to apply those tips. So start using those as you continue to read through your rule and see how they help you gain better clarity. Um, and then we've shared resources that will support you, financial resources, professional development resources, you know, utilizing the licensor on duty line, um, the frequently asked questions, the licensing newsletters, where you'll continue to get some um, added support. And before we close, you know, we really want to talk about what happens after today. You know, the change uh, process is never easy. It's, it can be anxiety provoking. What was once familiar becomes unfamiliar. It takes time to re-familiarize yourself with things. Sometimes you feel like there's, your sense of control has been jeopardized. You might just feel resistant to the process. 
Um, and that's true for any of us. Um, you know, it's a little nerve-wracking being me with this webinar, and you ask me a question, I have to take a minute with air silence to go find the rule. So I also can relate with, um, you know, that it, it's not always easy. Um, and change is also a lot to manage. We're trying to manage our own attitudes and emotions. We're trying to stay informed. You know, self-care is so important in this process, and that's a lot to keep track of. We want you to know that CDs, CDD's plan is to continue providing updates. You know, we have been working to have communication about what to expect and what's happening. In the fall of last year, we um, had workshops at the Basie conference where we shared what we, where we were at at that time. We're doing these webinars now. We have trainings coming. We have our newsletters that are happening, the frequently asked questions. We're going to continue trying to communicate. And we also want you to know that we're going to continue listening to what your challenges are and where your questions are. And we're using that information to help us develop the frequently asked questions, to help us develop the trainings so that they really meet your needs. Um, you know, your role in this process is, you know, remember that you've been successful. You're already a licensed program who has um, learned licensing rules and obtained a license. You've you have improved your program. If you're participating in STARS, you've done quality improvements. So this is something that you can be successful at, and I challenge you to feel curious about it. Think about how this change um, might make your program better, or what will happen if it really works. Um, and just kind of be curious about this process. Ultimately, it's important that we remember this isn't about licensing. This isn't about your program. This really is about the work we do together to serve Vermont's children and families. And um, by doing it together, we'll definitely get through this. So when you're patient with me, as I try to find a rule, we'll be patient with you as you keep asking your questions. And we invite you to continue doing that. We hope this webinar has really been helpful for you to know what to expect and think about how you're going to take this next year to come into compliance and ask your questions and get some ideas around resources. Mm -hmm. And again, I just want to reiterate that I know there were lots of questions that we weren't able to get to tonight, but I will be submitting them to our frequently asked questions. So look forward to our answers on the website through the frequently asked questions. And thank you so much for your patience with us. Um, this is one of our first opportunities to have 95 people on a webinar um, and be able to present this information. So thank you for being very patient with us while we did this.